They say it's like riding a bike. Once you learn how, you never forget. But the people that say that, I don't think they think about how difficult it is to learn how to ride a bike the first time. In fact, when I was eight years old, I was enamored with this particular bike. It's a 1970s Schwinn Stingray bike with a pretty cool gear shift, five speed, in the middle of the bike. But it wasn't so much this bike that intrigued me. In fact, it was a 13-year-old brown-skinned boy named um, Bobby, who was really small for his, his age. And every morning, I would go out on my grandmother's porch just to watch Bobby ride the bike. Bobby would pop a wheelie on this end of the block, ride it all the way down, and turn around without putting the tire down and ride back to the end of the block. And I was fascinated. One morning, I came out to see Bobby. And he wasn't out. And I said to my aunt, where's Bobby? Where's Bobby? And she said, Bobby's not out today. Then she turned to her sister and said, yeah, girl, yesterday Bobby was over in the alley trying to buy a shotgun, and they blew his brains out. You see, I grew up in Chicago. Chicago's recognized for interesting politics and also for wonderful tourist attractions. But it's also recognized as one of the uh, highest homicide rates or the city with highest homicide rates in America for young African-American men in impoverished neighborhoods. So despite or in spite of just having education, I needed also a little bit of inspiration. And I want to talk to you today about the notion of never underestimate the power of your inspiration. Inspiration is the process of being mentally stimulated to do or feel something or to be creative. Now, despite the fact that I grew up in a tough neighborhood, my mother always emphasized education. Look at that beautiful picture. <laughs> she would say, Ruben, you got to get your education. And she worked really hard, in fact, two jobs to put me in this school, private school, the first year. But she couldn't afford it after that. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time bouncing around. In fact, I attended five elementary schools before I graduated eighth grade. Uh, and as you can imagine, this instability in moving around meant that there were some academic deficiencies that surfaced. And this is one time in particular that really uh, stayed with me. I was joining the school in January, another handsome picture. I was joining the school in January, and all of the students knew one another. The teachers knew the students. And I came in, and she said to me, OK, Reuben, let's have you read. And I began to stutter and stammer. And she stopped me. And she called on another person to read. He read. She called on another person to read. She read. And this went on for the entire class period. After the class period ended, she stopped me and she said, Reuben, we're going to have to put you in a slow reading group. Now, at this time in my life, I was keeping a journal. And I had written about my bad day. And my mother wrote back, always do your best, no matter what group they put you in. You see, my mother was trying to provide me with the inspiration I needed to overcome difficulties. And in fact, it was quite inspirational. I finally graduated from eighth grade and was a freshman dressing like a professor. But again, these deficiencies could not be hidden. In fact, when I tell students that I wasn't a very good student in high school, they go, oh, no, you're a professor. And I said, no, no, I wasn't a good student. No, we don't believe you. And then I show them my course book. And even if you can't read the grades here, you see red and you know that's not good. In fact, algebra was a very difficult subject for me. My first semester in high school as a freshman, I took algebra one first semester, failed it. My second semester as a freshman, they put me in algebra one freshman uh, first semester again. I failed it again. My sophomore year, they put me into first semester freshman algebra one. This time I passed. And I used to like to tell people it's because by that time, I would memorized the book. <laughs> but the truth is, I had an inspirational teacher, Miss Flores. And she gave me inspiration and encouragement, but not the kind you think. Not like, oh, Reuben, you can do it. Go, go, go. If I didn't turn in my homework, she'd say, May, I'm going to call your mama. Or if I was talking in class, she'd say, May, I'm going to call your mama. And that would always get me to straighten up 
And she also provided at that time, besides that kind of inspiration, she also provided the training necessary. Now, along about this time in my life, remember, we had been moving place to place to place. And we finally moved to a community that my mother thought was safe. In fact, we were the only black family on the block. Uh, and so she allowed me to get a paper route. One morning, I'm pushing the cart down the street, and there's this dog that's coming up to me with the tail wagging. Now, in my old neighborhood, dogs were used for protection, so you got to imagine I'm a little bit apprehensive. So the dog's tail is wagging, pulling a man. And the man was this man. And he said, he said, good morning. My name is Ken, and this is my dog, Ebony. What's your name? I said, Reuben. If you've ever seen Criminal Minds, you know what I did next when I left him. I went straight to my mother, and I said, Mama, if something happens to me, this strange old man stopped me on the street. He turned out to be one of the best friends I could ever have. He was 38 years older than me. And he's very inspirational because he would always say stuff like, Reuben, have you pondered this? And that was the first time I had someone actually think or say something to me to make me think about the world in a wondrous way. With his help, with Ms. Flores' help, my mother's help, inspiration, I graduated high school. Now, I wasn't your typical high school graduate. In fact, in the springtime, my mother came to me of my senior year, and she said, Reuben, either you're going to go to college or you're going to get a job. But either way, you're getting out of here. Now, I might have appeared dumb, but I was a little bit smarter. I recognized that just getting a job would be wages for life versus the possibility of something else. So I applied to two schools. I got into the first room, Western Illinois University, with the condition that I go to a summer support program to transition me from high school into college. My mother's friend, who was an educator at the time, said, don't send him there. He will get lost. They won't take care of him. So my mother told me, you cannot go there. So I applied to Aurora University. 50 miles west of Chicago, a small liberal arts college. And the reason I applied is because they've been sending these flyers. You can see I didn't have any direction at all. Uh, but again, I wasn't a typical graduate. Let me give you some stats to help you. I finished high school with a 1.8 GPA on a 4.0 scale. I was ranked 306th out of 363 students. And I scored a 13 on the ACT. So I sent my, my paperwork in. A week later, I get a phone call. It's Joe, the admissions counselor. He says, your GPA is horrible. Your class rank is horrible. Your ACT score is horrible. Is there anything you can do about your ACT score? I said, sir, to be honest with you, when I took the exam, we were in a cafeteria next to a gymnasium. There was a basketball game going on, horns sounding, whistles blowing, people cheering. I couldn't focus. He said, I'll tell you what come to the university and take the test. So my mother puts me in the car, drives me 50 miles west. We get to Aurora. They put me in a room by myself. It's quiet. I'm focused, zeroed in, take the test. They graded right there on the spot. What did I get? A 13 again. <laughs> Joe says to me, I met you, and I believe you can do it. Of course, having or providing the inspiration was not much. Uh, it, it didn't change the deficiencies I had. And in fact, my first semester, I finished with a 0 0.88 GPA. I was on academic probation. My mother wrote me a simple note, son, you can do this. So I decided to try to focus a little more. And I began to focus a little more. And at the same time this was happening for me, I began to meet professors who would pour into me like Professor Cecilia Downs, my English professor, who was showing me all the things I needed to know and understand about English that I should have learned in high school. By the way, Chicago Public High Schools at the time were noted as the worst by the Secretary of Education. And then there was Professor Stephen Lay, who worked with me three hours a week during his office hours on algebra. And I know he got tired of me because I got tired of going, but I kept going. With their help and my mother's support and encouragement, I grad look at that handsome picture again. <laughs> I graduated. My mother comes to me and says, son, what are you going to do? I said, mama, I, I don't know. 
She said, you should go to law school. You like to argue. <laughs> but my mother didn't know law school was really about reading and writing. I wasn't very good at that. So I went to law school, applied to 11 law schools, got into one, failed out, came back home. My mama said, son, you got to do something else. Go back to school. I said, mama, I'm not sure. She said, go for business. I said, I don't want to do that. So I picked up the catalog from DePaul University, opened it up, flipped through it, read it, sociology. That grabbed me. Now, by this time, when I got to DePaul, I applied, got in conditionally. I had to have a 3.0, got there. All the things I had learned over time began to stick now. They're clicking. And I met a charismatic professor named Felix Padilla. And he said, listen, you're smart. You're smart. You should get a PhD. I'd never thought about that. And he said that. So I applied to five PhD programs. And I got into one. It was the University of Chicago. It was ranked number one in the field at that time. There, it was pretty intimidating because I was in a university with the best and the brightest from America, but not only America, from overseas and around the world. It was fascinating to me. There, my deficiencies were still not on par. I wasn't with everyone else, and I'm working hard, and I had to, at the same time, begin to meet professors who poured into me, like Professor Andy Abbott. Now, if you get a B in graduate school, that's the lowest you can get. You get below that, that's bad. Andy Abbott gave me a C minus on a paper. I had to swallow my pride and be humble and listen to his condescending comments every day. But he worked with me and gave me the tools. I met another professor, William Julius Wilson, who poured into me. He said to me, he heard me say an idea. He said, that was brilliant. Here he is, a MacArthur Genius Award winner telling you, you're brilliant. He began to give me inspiration. And largely with their help, I graduated. And I'm now here at Texas A&M providing inspiration to my students. But not only have I been able to do that, I've also had success outside of the university. I was a fellow at the W.B. Du Bois Institute at Harvard University. I was a visiting professor at MIT. And I'm an Association of Former Students Distinguished Achievement Award winner here at A&M. But not only that, I've been able to do this. For those of you who don't know, this is me outside on the street corner rapping as loud as I can. I'm somewhat of a social media phenomenon here at Texas A&M. And people say, well, how did that happen? Well, let me explain. Back in 2007, I'm in the Evans Library working on my book, typing, on, typing away, second book. A professor comes up to me and says, hey, is that the new MacBook Pro? I said, yes, sir, it is. He says, it can do so many things. I said, really? He says, I said, I only use it for word processing. So he says, let me show you. And he comes around, he shows me the doc. He shows me GarageBand and iMovies. So I start writing these rap songs and filming videos that were basically home movie and videos about my life. And I would upload them to YouTube under the name Reginald Stuckey, which was a nickname I had from years ago. And Dr. Mace here, stuck is here, and largely so my family and friends could see it. Well, one day in 2011, my student Jamie Shingleton calls me over. She says, Dr. May, when are you going to do that thing for us that you do in the videos? And I'm wondering, how does she even know about the videos? I said, what do you mean? She said, when are you going to rap for us? I said, I can't rap for you. I don't, I don't even know my lyrics. She says, you need to learn your lyrics. Hmm. So I spent two weeks learning one verse. Then I saw her on Northgate. Northgate. <laughs> and I said to her, are you ready? She says, yes. And I gave the verse. And she goes, that was great. So I started going outside to rap on the corner to practice with people looking at me and staying focused on my lyrics. And when I got out there, I discovered it was freeing and exhilarating. And it gave me another outlet. Largely because of her inspiration, I've been inspirational to other people because of that. And I'm able to do this. 
I enter class, then I harass. I put you through some deep morass. I see your face. I know you gas. I call on your girl, then watch her laugh. Because I got your brain. It's dangling. Like a thread be dangling. Stuck the man, start spangling. You don't even know it. You tell your friends, I'm out my mind. The truth is, I'm in your mind. Try to help your little star to shine. Make you bling. Make you blind. But you don't even know what I'm doing. You don't even know who pursuing. You don't even know who to shooting. You don't even know why they're booing. You don't even know what a clue is. Transformation in your life. Match make you and your wife in Stuckyville just live the life. Some of y'all love it, do it twice. Ask your girl, yeah, I'm nice. Black and gold, watch the ice, take a chance, roll the dice, verse done, nice slice. Woo! So never underestimate the power of your inspiration. Thank you.